Sylvia Foster Frau is an investigative reporter for The Post. In March, she spent a day knocking on doors in southern New Mexico with a group of local organizers called Empowerment Congress. And Maria Alvarado was one of the first folks who they approached. They literally went up to the gate in front of her home, and she was out there with her son and called her over and started kind of filling out the questionnaire. The first question they usually asked was like an open-ended, like, is there anything about the government or the services that you feel like could be better? And everyone always mentioned the water. How do you think our uh, public service providers and local government is treating us? Well, so far, so good, except for the water part. So this was all happening in Sunland Park, New Mexico, which is a small city in the south of the state. And it's right there in this little wedge that borders Texas and Mexico. And that's where, in December, this kind of uproar was caused over the water quality. Slimy and slick water conditions. That is how some residents in Santa Teresa and Sunland Park are describing the water coming out of their faucets and their showers. What happened was caustic soda from one of the arsenic treatment plants was being pumped into the water. And it's typically done that to help remove the arsenic, but what happened is it malfunctioned and basically too much of it was poured into the water and it caused um, a really oily, gooey substance to emerge from the taps. And so people started noticing it and they raised alarms about it. And it took a few days before the water utility notified the community that indeed it was not safe for them to be drinking it. And then it took a another few days for them to actually fix it. And according to the Camino Real Regional Utility Authority, the advisory is due to increased pH levels in the water. Residents in these affected areas are advised not to use the water coming out of the faucets for drinking, washing dishes, cooking, or even bathing. So when the state realized that the utility had failed to notify the community about this caustic soda dump and the malfunction that happened there, they did an investigation. And they also uncovered that there were illegally high levels of arsenic in some of the water samples. And that, in fact, three of the four arsenic treatment plants had been offline for more than a year. And that's why these canvassers came out, to find out what the community knew about the water they were drinking and what they were doing to protect themselves. So in your home, you don't cook or drink it, is that correct? I cook with the water, Sometimes. But, I, but I boil it. I don't know if, yeah. it's, if, it's, if that's right for me to drink. Um, well, we're recommending that you use bottled water for drinking and cooking as uh -huh. the best way okay. to preserve your health. Mm -hmm. And so these canvassers were telling her that actually um, you should try to avoid cooking with it if you can, which, you know, for some people, I think a lot of folks do try to do that. But it is expensive to constantly be buying bottled water for drinking and cooking and brushing your teeth and all of those things. And especially me with my son, you know, I have to be very careful with him because he's like, I'm thirsty. And he takes three or four bottles of water. <laughs> and I said, you know, I get, yes, I it's get scarce. it. Uh -huh. And I tell him, and he goes, but we can't drink the water here, Mom, because it's got poison and it's going to kill me. This year, Sylvia has been investigating access to clean water around the country. Who can safely drink from the tap and who has to rely on bottled water, like Maria and her son? This month marks 10 years since the beginning of the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, where lead and possible bacteria were found in the water. And it's also 50 years since Congress passed the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is supposed to limit toxins in American drinking water to safe levels. But Sylvia found that that isn't the case in Sunland Park, New Mexico. And it hasn't been for a long, long time. When I was scrolling through these state and federal databases and requesting more and more information about the drinking water in this community, I discovered that in each of the last 16 years, at least in Sunland Park, there were water samples that showed illegally high levels of arsenic in their water. And actually, there were some instances when it was exceedingly above the legal limit, like in 2016, when arsenic levels reached five times that amount. From the newsroom of The Washington Post, this is Post Reports. I'm Martine Powers. It's Thursday, April 18th. Today, 
a New Mexico city where the water has long had arsenic levels above the legal limit, and what it can tell us about access to clean drinking water across the country. Sylvia spoke to my co-host, Alahe Azadi. Can you tell me a little bit more about Sunlim Park's demographics and its history with water quality? Yeah, so Sunlin Park, New Mexico, was formed in 1983, and it previously was a collection of colonias, which are kind of these low-income, unincorporated neighborhoods or villages that are very common along the U.S.-Mexico border. And since then, kind of has had an interesting history. On the one hand, there has been a landfill with an incinerator that caused a lot of issues and inspired a lot of protests in the 1980s and 1990s until the incinerator was removed in 1991. It's also made national headlines because it's a border crossing place where migrants have crossed. And that has come up a lot of times. There was actually a private border wall that was raised with funds from an organization chaired by a former Trump administration official, Steve Bannon, that was erected in that Mm. area. Back in the 1980s, there was a worry that the landfill in the community and the incinerator that was next to it that burned medical supply waste was polluting the water and possibly the air. And so a group of over 100 residents came together. They created the Concerned Citizens of Sunland Park group, and they protested and successfully um, advocated to remove the incinerator from their community. And um, the state agreed to require the landfill to um, kind of include a series of protections, including like installing a liner to protect the groundwater from the landfill. And so all of that is in the backdrop of this community that is today still working class. It's 95 percent Latino. Most folks there are Mexican-American and many speak Spanish as a first language at home. Um, that has double the national poverty and uninsured rates compared to the rest of the nation, according to the census. And you have a group of people who now, in light of the new kind of revelations about the water quality, are trying to fight for something that felt very similar to what they were fighting more than 40 years ago. And in fact, many of the most active folks today are older retirees who were protesting back then more than 40 years ago and know what kind of the power of collective action can actually do for a community and understand the history of what their community has been through. Yeah, I I definitely want to learn more about what that is looking like on the ground. I want to understand also a little bit more about arsenic and that you know when i hear that i i don't know too much about it i know it's it's dangerous you shouldn't consume it but how is it getting in the drinking water in this community and what are the effects of it if you are exposed to it so arsenic in new mexico is mostly naturally occurring and it's actually naturally occurring in different pockets throughout the united states it's in the rock and soil and the ground and it seeps into the groundwater and so municipalities have to set up treatment plants um, to filter that out into their drinking water and sunland park and the nearby santa teresa neighborhood which are both served by the same water utility which people call crua the camino real regional utility authority They have four arsenic treatment plants. What's tricky about arsenic is some people have kind of dubbed it like the silent killer because it is completely soluble with water and it does not give an odor or a taste or a smell. So if you like had a glass of water in front of you, you wouldn't necessarily know whether it had high levels of arsenic in it or not. Mm. And also like the filters that you can buy in stores also do not typically filter it. It's a very complicated type of contaminant. It can cause a really wide range of damage over the long term. So what's really important about this community and this issue is that it's kind of about chronic exposure. I think it's very easy and kind of obvious to see like immediate poisoning, like if you think about food poisoning or immediate poisoning from water. But this arsenic level and what we're talking about is chronic exposure, which is like over time, year after year after year, experiencing high levels of arsenic in the water that you're drinking. 
And what um, scientists and the kind of folks who study this have found is that chronic exposure can cause cancer of the skin, lung, bladder, all sorts of kinds, heart disease. It's also been associated with kidney disease, diabetes, cognitive impairment, lasting harm to fetal development. There were a couple women that I spoke to in Sunland Park who have children with disabilities that they believe it's because they were drinking the tap water and had been drinking it for a long time um, when they were pregnant with them. You mentioned you talked with some people who who said that they had health problems because of exposure to arsenic. So can you tell me a little bit more about some of those folks and what they shared with you? Yeah. So I met Elvia Acevedo. She was 65 years old and is living with her adult son who has Down syndrome. And when she spoke to me, she actually had a number of stacks of like bottled water in her living room, which was very common to see there. Like people in their living rooms and their kitchen just had like either huge gallons of water or if they were older and don't have like grandchildren around to constantly help them carry it, they would just have tons of those smaller water bottles that they were using for everything. She talked about her suspicions of how the drinking water has affected the health of her and also her family. She recently was diagnosed with diabetes, and she has suspicions it may have been from the tap water. And she also has suspicions that her son and his condition was also because of the tap water she was drinking. Elvia was saying that her son was born with thyroid problems, asthma, and diabetes, and that she had been drinking the water during that time. But she said, you know, who would pay attention to me? Who would hacer me caso? I was just mm-hmm. like a nobody who was young, and I didn't. Basically, like she didn't know any better to even think about the water and how it may have been affecting her unborn child. She was actually around, um, you know, over 40 years ago and was involved with some of the activism then. And now pretty much any board meeting you go to that's talking about the water quality, she shows up and speaks at a public meeting to talk about the issue. Okay, estamos aquí un, gru- un grupo de residentes de la ciudad de Salem Park. And again, we're here as residents of the city of Sunland Park. Estamos pidiendo que, por favor, todos los de por Crua. They're asking for everyone associated with Crua. Renuncien a su puesto de Crua. That they resign from their positions at Crua. And, you know, basically says that she believes people there are dying from the long-term effects of arsenic. She said recently to me that she feels like they're paying for something that's poisoning them. Is it possible to know if any of the health problems that people in the community are experiencing are directly caused by arsenic? Yeah, that's a tricky question, and it's very hard to prove because, first, for a lot of these communities that are disproportionately impacted by toxic water, they tend to be lower income, they tend to be communities of color, communities that already often battle with disproportionate rates of diabetes and cancer and all of these things. So it's very hard sometimes to extract what is something that's happening because of your socioeconomic position in this country and what is something that's directly tied to the arsenic in your water. And a- another kind of issue is that because it's illnesses that are caused from chronic arsenic, they actually don't have a good way of measuring that. Because you can take a lab test for your blood or your urine that will tell you in that moment what is the arsenic concentration that you have. But if you haven't had drinking water for the last week, but maybe you did have it for 20 years up until two years ago, that's not going to show up. The lab report is looking at what you have right then and there in your system. Um, There have been some initial studies in the field of epigenetics where the hope is that you could look at someone's DNA and be able to tell whether things were caused from drinking water or outside contaminants and not something genetic. But that's like very, very preliminary science. Hmm. And yet at the same time, as you you reported, that 
investigators for the state had found that arsenic treatment plants in this area had had been offline for over a year, which I just have to ask, how does that even happen? I think we're still trying to figure that out. I still have not gotten a clear answer or understanding of why those were offline for as long as they were and why, in fact, even beyond that year and a half, water samples in this area were testing with illegally high levels of arsenic. I was able to find um, back 16 years from today that there were samples of water being tested that violated the arsenic standards um, for safe drinking water. And it's just unclear why that wasn't addressed for so many years and also why there wasn't a stricter crackdown, right, from the government agencies that are supposed to be regulating these utilities. Yeah. Isn't there a federal agency, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, that Shouldn't they be stepping in to to do something about these situations? Right. And also the EPA grants the state what they call primacy, where the state's environmental department is supposed to be the one kind of in Hmm. charge and monitoring, which is actually the case for New Mexico. Um, So that New Mexico is the one who's gathering the data. And then it's also recorded by the EPA. And yeah, in both cases, they were, you know, CRUA, the utility was sent notices about their violation. They were sent kind of different kind of compliance related letters but there hadn't been a change, right? There was nothing, no sort of significant crackdown until maybe now when in March the state has issued a $251,000 fine to the utility. They arrived and did like an unannounced water sampling series of tests and found that one out of the 10 samples that they did, even now, four months after kind of all of this has exploded, still had illegally high levels of arsenic in it. Wow. Um, so they've, they've begun to kind of really crack down, but it's still unclear why all of this time um, the utility was not able to keep its arsenic levels under control. And so when, Sylvia, when you approached the utility in charge in this community about this, what did they have to say? Um, You know, they cited challenges in finding operators, which is a not even just a statewide, but a national issue is finding qualified water utility operators. Um, They've also been having challenges with development. The area is growing tremendously. The water utility is still trying to address um, 58, quote, significant deficiencies that the state found when it completed an investigation of the utility. And so they are still trying to get through all of those. Um, The interim executive director of the water utility said recently that they're just over 50 percent of the way there. They've also been required by the state to hand over a bunch of records and documents related to their water as the state continues to investigate them. And the utility has made other changes. Their notices are going out in Spanish. They're testing for arsenic twice a month now. The utility also says that they're adding new technology to be able to monitor the water's chemical and contaminant levels remotely. But they also told me they had to be careful about talking too much to me because they did receive a tort claim, which is kind of the first step in a lawsuit by a group of lawyers representing residents around this water issue. And so because of that reason, they basically said they wouldn't be able to tell me more. And then were there any local officials, like town officials? Because... Obviously, you know, the there's federal, there's state, but but the, the folks on the ground closest to the community, I would imagine, are like town council members. So did any of them express concern to you? And, and did you approach them? What did they have to say? So I didn't hear back from the mayor. Um, I did hear back in my reporting from Alberto Jaramillo, who... Um, serves as a city council member and is also a member of the Water Utility Board. The utility board, which has seven members, is made up of elected officials. And so it is a it's a community public water system. Um, And when I spoke to him, um, he basically said that it was news to him that the arsenic contamination had gone on for so many years. He had only recently learned it and that he still drinks the tap water and he believes it is safe. He said if somebody had cancer because of the water, like he wanted to see the proof. 
I also spoke with Eric Olson, who was a former attorney for the EPA. Now he's a health strategist and advocate at the Natural Resources Defense Council. And he talked about how in Sunland Park and its water utility was basically an example of the government failing to protect public health. I would definitely call this a public health crisis, especially since, you know, arsenic, it's cumulative. It's not like if you stop consuming it today, suddenly you're out of the woods. If, If you're exposed for 10 years to that carcinogen, a known human carcinogen, the cancer starts and it may not manifest itself. There's a latency period. It may not manifest itself immediately, but it may have already started to grow in your body. And what do you make of the fact that it, these repeat violations have been allowed to continue for so many years? Yeah, I think that's another aspect of it. Just what I think is outrageous that, you know, that state officials city officials and federal officials all have known for well over a decade that this water system has a very serious arsenic contamination problem and have not insisted that it be resolved. And I've just seen this in location after location, city after city across the country. We saw it in Flint, um, We, you know, where basically uh, the public was not given really accurate, full information about what the contamination was and what the health effects were. I would say that this is a classic example of government at every level failing to protect public health um, for an inexcusable period of time. After the break, what protections are in place to prevent things like arsenic from getting in tap water? And where those protections are falling down. We'll be right back. Sylvia, what federal regulations exist right now to protect people from substances like arsenic showing up in their tap water? Yeah, so that that goes back to the Safe Drinking Water Act, which um, the EPA has a list of dozens of contaminants that have regulations in place where they should not be going past a particular level. Um, And so water utilities across the country are required to report either annually or sometimes quarterly um, what those levels are in their water. And also they're required to report what they're doing to treat the water for various things. So there's a lead and copper rule that shows that you've been following the required treatment to make sure that um, there isn't lead coming from the source and kind of other standards like that that they are regularly reporting to the government. It sounds like from what you're sharing that the issue in Sunland Park in part is the plants that were supposed to be functioning didn't function properly. Right. Yeah. Um, But the other piece of this, I wonder, is whether the existing regulations around what is safe to begin with are adequate. Yeah. So that's a kind of whole other um, issue here, which is that there have been studies that found that even in communities that are within the legal limit. So the legal limit right now is 10 parts per billion, which that's kind of the the maximum amount of arsenic that's allowed in water. They say 10 ppb. Um, But there's been studies that found that even communities that have consistently, let's say, eight parts per billion in their water. Which is within the limit. Which is within the legal limits still can actually cause an elevated risk of cancer. And arsenic, being a carcinogen, basically means that any amount of arsenic in your water is simply, like, not safe. And by many other standards kind of set by the EPA, that would be too high of an acceptable cancer risk. Um, But because of kind of politics and industry pressure and other things that kind of former EPA officials and other public health advocates talk to me about, the EPA kind of sets these standards, and that's how they are. So it actually even used to be higher. It used to be 50 parts per billion. Um, Oh, wow. Yeah, and but there have been pushes to lower it even further, and they've been unsuccessful so far. I mean, that's kind of wild to me because having this in the drinking water is linked clearly to an increased risk of certain types of cancers. And so why is any level acceptable? Like, what is exactly this pressure? You know, to not have as aggressive regulations around it, is it the 
the industry being the utility industry? Are they concerned about the cost? Is it just not feasible to completely remove this since it does naturally occur in a lot of places in the groundwater? Yeah, you pretty much nailed it. So um, water utilities have these larger associations and organizations that have been known in the past to kind of pressure the government and basically saying that, like, the the cost would be really high, including actually elected officials, too, who represent areas that have this naturally occurring arsenic. A former senator from New Mexico was very much opposed to lowering the arsenic levels from 50 parts per billion to 10 parts per billion, you know, back in the day. Because of that reason, he said it would be too costly for municipalities to implement. It was Democrat mayors and councilmen joined by Republicans across the land saying, don't make us spend all this money when there's no benefit to the public health. I yield the floor. Though sure enough, you know, it was changed and the municipalities have since adapted for the most part. So, yeah, the the cost is definitely a a factor. And um, there are... For some contaminants more than others, there is the question of technology. Like in some cases, it is just very hard to mm. get down to that zero. That's the goal. Um, but right. but with arsenic, there are ways to lower. And in fact, there are two states, New Hampshire and New Jersey, who have a five parts per billion maximum contaminant level for arsenic. What have you learned about water regulation in the country more Broadly, do we know how many communities are like Sunland Park dealing with arsenic or other dangerous substances in their tap water? Yeah, so I've learned that there are many utilities across the country who repeatedly violate federal standards. Based on the EPA database, it looks like there is about 7,400 utilities that for the past three years, every single quarter reported some kind of violation to the Safe Drinking Water Act. And so the concerns among public health experts and former EPA officials are that it's become very difficult for the EPA to kind of crack down on these utilities and that these um, utilities' broader associations basically said big picture like politics of money have played too much a role in not only determining these maximum levels of contaminants, but also in kind of the enforcement end of what to do with these communities. Mm. And in some cases, I think it's well-intentioned. If a really poor and struggling utility in a lower-income community is just struggling to pay for the treatment they need for their water, you know, levying heavy fines isn't necessarily going to solve the problem. But there's kind of this tension, right, between supporting a utility and the government's role in that and and get helping them get their water safe Um but also regulating them and making sure that they understand there is pressure to comply and that room for mismanagement is really just not possible when it comes to people's drinking water. Yeah. And what does the EPA have to say about that? So the EPA said um, generally that safe drinking water is a top priority for the agency. They said that They've been making and will continue to make, like, enforcement a priority. And they also cited some infrastructure investments. The Biden administration has had a couple um, bills passed that included water infrastructure that they believe will help with that. And Sylvia, when you were talking to people in Sunland Park, what did they have to say about why they were dealing with this situation? What were their feelings and, and thoughts around that? Yeah, um, a lot of them just feel very unrepresented. Um, One aspect of this whole story is that many of the community members here are Spanish language, but not all of the government notices from the water utility and from the city were being sent in Spanish, and many of the meetings were not in Spanish or had translators. Um, The utility actually just hired its first public information officer in an attempt to kind of help with communication, but that officer does not speak Spanish and also would need a translator or interpreter um, for his messaging. And then atop from that, I think they just feel like they are, you know, they're Latino, they're lower income, and they feel like this is an example where racism and classism have played a role in the kind of basic services they get to get in the United States. 
How was it being with these community members as they were saying, you know, th- they're they're trying to fight for healthier water? What struck you and what impression did they leave you with? I think I was really struck by their conviction and their kind of tenacity in navigating this government fight. This is Elvia talking about how this is the community is is who elected these officials. Yo le dice al mayor, ¿cómo llamas un ciudad, un pueblo que no lo has levantado? Y ahí donde estás tú sentado es por nosotros. Claro. Porque la voz y el poder de nosotros te tenemos ahí. ¿Dónde está el amor, la calidad que tienes por la comunidad? Mm-hmm. And how is it that they can't care for the same people that put them into those positions? She says, where is the love? Where is the kind of care for our community? Elvia said that they're fighting for something that's very real for them. Sylvia, thank you so much for bringing this story to us today. Thanks so much for having me. Sylvia foster Frau is an investigative reporter for The Post. She spoke with my co-host, Alahe Azadi. Today, we've got some updates on Donald Trump's criminal trial in New York. Jury selection continues. And though Thursday started with seven of the 12 primary jurors having been picked, that number quickly dropped to six. When one sworn juror came in saying that she had become concerned that people she knew had already been able to identify her as a juror from the information reported publicly. Because of that, she said that she was worried about her ability to be a fair and impartial juror. She was excused from the case. It underscores why the judge has been so adamant about keeping the identities of these jurors secret. And behind the scenes, Trump's legal team is scrambling to find and review the social media accounts of the potential jurors. When they find posts that are critical of Trump, they are racing to show them to the judge to try to get these people dismissed. It's one way in which one of Trump's favorite political tools, social media, has turned into a significant legal tool. There's plenty more to say about the trial so far and important takeaways from jury selection. Tomorrow, you'll hear Alahe unpack all of this with our colleague Aaron Blake in this week's episode of The Campaign Moment. You will not want to miss it. That's it for Post Reports. Thanks for listening. Today's show was produced by Emma Talkoff. It was mixed by Sean Carter and edited by Monica Campbell and Maggie Penman. I'm your host, Martine Powers. We'll be back tomorrow with more stories from The Washington Post.